Welcome back, everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our next speaker, Stanley Beck. Stan has been doing, for since his PhD work, has been doing really interesting things relating to hybrid systems and, in particular, reachability analysis. And in my view, has been doing some of the most uh, interesting research in the area, and in particular, looking at questions such as is it better to be uh, building tools based on nonlinear solvers or linear solvers? How can we uh, use existing tools to solve different kinds of problems? Um, and has also been doing uh, very valuable work for the community by developing uh, translations between different modeling tools to help facilitate comparing the different technologies. Hybrid systems, and in particular hybrid systems tools, is a very active area these days, and there are many different efforts. And a big challenge in this area is to transfer knowledge and lessons between different groups. And this is something that uh, Stan has been doing a great job, I think, of. Uh, contributing to and help help make happen. So without a further ado, please welcome Stan. So, uh, thank you, Waleed. So I'm Stanley Bach. I work uh, in the United States in the Air Force Research Lab. And so a um, quick overview of the US Air Force. They're concerned with three domains, uh, cyberspace, space, and air. So airspace and cyberspace. Um, Air Force Research Lab is you know, a, a subset of the Air Force. We do a lot of uh, research type applications in these three domains. And there's various sites around the US uh, for Air Force Research Lab. And so the site I'm in, in particular, is in Dayton, Ohio. And it's the Aerospace Systems Director, or Air Vehicles Director. Um, <coughs> so uh, before I start, I want to show sort of a, a motivating application. And that's a, a system we call AutoGCAS, or Automated Ground Collision Avoidance uh, System. And so. Uh, this is a system, it's sort of not hard to imagine a system. You're flying an aircraft, you don't want it to crash into the ground. So um, design a system such that if the pilot's getting you know, in danger of crashing into the ground, it'll sort of take over and recover. Um, and so we saw some versions of this earlier with uh, you know, like sailboats. There was a, a system that prevented crashing into the obstacles, essentially. So it's sort of not a new idea. It's not a new idea with the Air Force uh, either, right? So this serious development on this type of system started 20, 30 years ago. Uh, but it's only now that it's actually being deployed, and so there's, there's reasons for that as well. But the current system, it's a, it's a collaboration. Uh, the, the development is a collaboration between Air Force Research Lab, uh, NASA had a part, um, uh, Lockheed Martin, who's the contractor on the effort, had a part, and I think even the Swedish Air Force uh, also took part in some of the testing for the system too, so it's, it's an international effort uh, as well. Um, so one question you might have is, why do we need this type of system? Like, don't we have very good pilots? Why are they crashing into the ground? And so it's not on purpose. Um, the, the sort of fundamental problem is that aircraft are, are fast, and sort of these jet aircraft that the Air Force is using are very fast. And so it's easy sometimes for a pilot to um, get sort of fixated on a target that they're looking at and sort of lose track of their surroundings. And you can get into a bad situation sort of very quickly. Um, there's other things that can happen. Um, for example, if you're flying uh, in canyons very low to the ground, which you know, these systems have to operate in those environments, uh, you can't have an, something that stops you from crashing into the ground as long as you're 10,000 feet in the air. That's not good enough. Um, if you're flying in these type of unknown canyons and you're sort of going over a horizon, it's possible that you get into a situation that's unrecoverable that you wouldn't know about. Um, and sort of the, the third reason is uh, these aircraft are actually so fast that the, the limitation to their maneuverability uh, is the human. So the aircraft can turn so fast that if you're going around a high-speed turn, the blood can rush from the pilot's head, and basically the pilot will pass out. So you're limited in maneuverability based on what the pilot can handle. Um, so uh, let's see a video of this system uh, in place. <coughs> So this is uh, it's sort of the cockpit view uh, of an aircraft. This was in 2016, so it's uh, one year ago uh, in May. It was in New Mexico, so it's over the United States, not a dangerous area. It's a training mission. For, uh, there's, there's instructors trying to teach this pilot about different maneuvers on the aircraft. Right? So there shouldn't be danger in this type of system. Um, some things to notice, this is the altitude estimate right now. So he starts out at around 17,000 feet. That's over 5,000 meters uh, in there, so he's pretty high up. Um, this line here is the horizon line. So right now he's sort of angled slightly. Um, 
So you'll see what happens uh, when he enters sort of one of these high speed turns. Uh, so you kind of heard his breathing there, and at some point he sort of breathed out and you didn't hear anything else. That was the pilot actually passing out because the uh, vehicle was sort of turning too quickly. And then the horizon sort of disappeared, so the aircraft kind of turned upside down, and now it's going towards the ground, and this is sort of minus 25 degrees, minus 30 degrees uh, towards the ground. Um, furthermore, he was doing a high-speed turn, so the aircraft was going sort of maximum afterburner, so full speed on the aircraft. So now the aircraft is going full speed towards the ground uh, with a passed out pilot. Right. Uh, so there you saw actually the, when the pilot was still at about 8,000 feet, the system predicted that he was going to crash into the ground. The system took over, did a recovery maneuver, it rolled the aircraft upright, and then pulled up uh, at a sort of a high velocity. Uh, the altitude estimate is around 4,000 feet now. This is sort of a radar estimate, about 3,000 feet, so down to about 1,000 meters above the ground. So you could imagine if the system didn't take over in the next second or so, the, the pilot would be dead, essentially, um, during a training mission. Uh, the aircraft costs $25 million, so also $25 million would be, uh, would be lost as well. There's a lot of training that goes into this, there'd be a lot of reviews, but um, this is sort of a confirmed save, we call this, right? And so since the system was deployed, every few months this team that developed it, they get emails of these confirmed saves, where it saves pilots' lives and saves aircraft. So it's sort of a very nice system. There's probably also many more unconfirmed saves where we won't get the public information about the, uh, the sort of pilot's life being saved. Um, so uh, the Air Force likes this system. It's very good, right? Um, but there is a problem, right? And so what's the problem? The problem is um, not sort of what you might imagine that. Uh, you know, this is a talk on verification. This system was designed, and it wasn't designed using verification methods. It was designed using simulation and, and lots of testing, right? Um, so you might think that there are sort of cases that were missed in the process where we can't simulate every state, so we're not sure if the system's safe, which would be true. But actually, the Air Force is very happy with the system. We like the system. Uh, the, the sort of problem is when we go back to Lockheed Martin, who developed the system, we tell them, you know, this is great for F-16s. Uh, let's put this on the F-22s. Let's put it on F-35s. There's dozens of aircrafts the Air Force has. There's drones. We also don't want those crashing. Let's put it in all these systems. Uh, essentially, the, the cost of doing simulation and testing is very high. So to put it onto another generation of aircraft uh, or another completely type, another platform, essentially, you have to go through all this simulation and testing again. Uh, so really, the, 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 the potential for formal methods and verification I see is to not eliminate testing altogether. We'll still do flight tests. But it's to speed up this process and reduce the costs. Um, if you look at um, models of how an F-16 behaves, so uh, I'm not an aerospace engineer. I sit around a lot of aerospace engineers, though, so I ask them what's sort of the uh, basic model for an aircraft that sort of makes sense that you can make predictions. And so they'll, they'll pull out a, you know, a first year aerospace engineering textbook, Stevens and Lewis. Uh, there's an appendix in there about F-16 modeling and it includes code and you can run this code uh, and have a basic model of an F-16 and it sort of goes up in complexity from there. Uh, looking at this model, it's about 15 variables. Um, it's nonlinear differential equations. It's got lookup tables because uh, I asked why are there lookup tables? Isn't this like a first principles model? Essentially, the way you model these systems is you'll build them and you put them into a wind tunnel and you sort of measure how much lift, what are the moments at different sort of angles of attack at different speeds, and then you put this data into a lookup table and you interpolate. And that's the model that's used to sort of make predictions, right? So um, that's complicated for verification methods, right? And so I, I won't say that we're there, right? We could design a system for a system of that complexity or even more complexity is really what they would want. Um, but I think we're close, and so that's why it's a research area, that's why I do research in it, and I think we're sort of making progress in uh, various aspects and hoping to move towards a system that can help um, you know, verify uh, sort of ground collision avoidance. Um, and so ground collision avoidance isn't the only thing we want, so we saw some, uh, previously there's a talk on you know, air collision avoidance, that's also something the Air Force would like uh, for their aircraft, and you can imagine it's sort of more complicated because it's not just two aircraft, but there might be three aircraft. If you do sort of collaborative maneuvers, they might lead into each other. Uh, 
Air Force likes to fly in formation as well, so pilots will sort of look like they're colliding and then at the last minute turn back. So you don't want false positives, otherwise pilots will disable the system. Um, so there's sort of a lot of potential if we can make verification work. So the full title of the talk is Formal Verification of Cyber-Physical Systems Using Flow Pipe Construction uh, of Hybrid Automaton. So I'm the eighth speaker here, and uh, you've seen every speaker seems to have a similar but slightly different definition. Uh, and so sort of my favorite variant of this is actually the, the US Congress passed the definition of cyber-physical systems. Um, it was signed by the president as well. So um, this is this year, uh, in 2017. Uh, it's not much different than the other definitions you've seen, though. So it's, um, you have IT components, you have physical elements, you have sensors, actuators, timing matters, performance matters. So. I won't belabor the point. Um, formal verification. Um, so I work in the verification and validation group. Um, inside that group, uh, there's sort of two key questions we focus on. So verification asks if you built the system right, and validation concisely it'll ask if you built the right system, right? Uh, and these are slightly different questions. Um, so verification, typically you're given a model of the system and a sort of a specification and you want to check that the model obeys the specification. So it's easy to sort of describe in terms of software. Um, if you have a list of numbers, you have some model of how sorting works, and your output is a sorted list of numbers, then you might say, is this sorting algorithm correct? Um, testing is a means of verification. So it's probably the main means of systems that are actually deployed. So don't discount testing. Um, it's informal verification, though, because uh, in practice, you can use it to find errors, but you can't always use it to sort of prove the absence of errors. Um, you also can get in certain cases where there's ambiguity, right? So I said I wanted to sort of list of numbers, and if you're using floating point numbers, this could be a possible input, right? Not a number, infinity, negative infinity. And what's the specification? So the specification I said was the list of numbers is sorted. So that's also an informal specification. You really should be giving a, a formal specification if you want to do formal verification. Um, so you can have issues not just with the, the sort of the model and the proofs, but the specifications as well. Um, so if you have a specification that seems like a precise specification that you know your autonomous car should never kill something that's identified as a human, um, that's ambiguous. That's ambiguous, right? Because what does kill mean, right? It's not mathematically defined. Um, this is actually images from uh, this is an image recognition paper for certain misclassifications, and some of them are very interesting, right? Like this picture, it identified it as a cherry, but there as a chair, the real answer is cherry, but it thought it was a Dalmatian, right? But there's really both in the, in the image. So there's, there's ambiguity even in identification. Um, there's other specification issues where even if you make your specification precise, uh, th that sort of can give you a false sense of security, right? If, if your specification is you never you know, hit an object that's identified as a human going more than five miles an hour, right? So something that satisfies that spec is don't identify anything as a human, right? And then you're guaranteed to satisfy that. So having precise specifications can create a, a false sense of security uh, as well. So you have to be careful about this. Um, and a lot of times it also moves complexity, right? So creating a correct specification is re related to uh, requirements verification uh, or creating good requirements, right? So uh, sometimes the hardest part becomes coming up with a complete and consistent specification. Uh, what about um, testing? Testing is the, probably the main means that people verify systems that are built today, but it's not, it's not perfect, right? So when it's incomplete, so there might be cases that you miss. You only have the, at what point do you stop with that, right? So is one test sufficient? Probably not. Is 10 sufficient? It depends on the system, right? In practice, probably what happens a lot of time is we have you know, one month to do testing and this much money. So you'd spend that and then you're sort of satisfied. You haven't found any problems. Um, but it's, it's certainly not uh, a complete system. Uh, especially, uh, another thing that can happen is it's, it's sort of very slow in terms of if you want to have confidence of low probability events, right? If I wanted to prove that, uh, this was sort of a study by the Rand Institute uh, about autonomous driving. And so they asked the question, if you wanted to prove that, you know, autonomous car had a safety rate that was, you know, 10 to the minus 9 or some, some very low probability, how many miles of driving would you have to do? And so if you really want confidence in that level of safety, you might need to drive uh, millions of miles, sometimes billions. Um, so in contrast, formal verification um, is sort of a similar setup, but now given a formal or mathematical model of uh, your, your system,
given a formal or mathematical model of your specification, you want to know, does the model provably obey the specification? Uh, so uh, now you no longer just have this. Uh, this is now a summing function. You have some code that describes how to sum numbers, and you have sort of a mathematical description, what it means to be the sum of the numbers, uh, sum of a list of numbers. Mm -hmm. Now, we hope that when you have formal verification methods that work on models, you can create systems that are sort of more trustworthy and cheaper. So that gets into the auto GCAS system, right? We want the system, but we want it to be cheaper. Um, and there's still a lot of work to be done. It's still very much a research area. So uh, my talks will focus on sort of the state of the art in um, you know, methods that people use for reachability analysis, which is one way to analyze cyber physical systems, and sort of some newer things, too, that I think are, are promising. Uh, ideally, if you have a verification method, it wouldn't just tell you the system is safe or not. It would also produce counterexamples for various reasons in hybrid systems reachability tools, you don't always get counterexamples. You'll just get these yes-no answers. Um, so for this thing, you might think that a counterexample is actually, well, this function doesn't check for overflow. And so if you give it very large numbers, then you might get an output that's, uh, that doesn't match the mathematical description. So that could be a counterexample. So the, the sort of second part of the, the question is, uh, did you build the right system? And that's uh, the validation question. So I won't stick too long on that. But that's sort of one reason why we're not going to eliminate testing, uh, flight testing. This is more about uh, sort of environmental assumptions, context. You're still going to have to check those. Right? If I have an auto GCAS system for my F-16 and I put it into uh, you know, my quadcopter, is the system correct or not? Well, it is, but in, in a certain context. Um, so CPS has unique challenges because there's model accuracy questions, as was sort of alluded to before. So uh, whatever model you come up with, um, if it's deterministic, it's going to be wrong. Um, so there's different ways to deal with this mathematically, right? So rather than having a deterministic system, we can use a, a sort of an approximation model. Uh, but then your results should have, sort of won't be as trusted, right? So it's sort of good for checking, but you won't have guarantees. Uh, the other two ways you can deal with it uh, is to add non-determinism into the model. So I still have a formal model, but it'll capture sets of behaviors. And then if the real system is somewhere in that set, then you can still do proofs. Um, and then the other way you do this is using probabilities. So you have distributions of behaviors. And again, you can prove uh, probabilistic properties about your system. Uh, so that was formal verification. Um, hybrid automata. So hybrid automata are, I mentioned when you do formal verification, you need a mathematical model of a system. So Hybrid automata are these mathematical models for cyber-physical systems. Um, historically, they've sort of come, in my mind, out of finite state machines. And they look very similar when you draw them. Um, so a finite state machine looks something like this. There's uh, a set of modes. Uh, there's transitions between the modes. And there's rules on when these transitions occur, um, which are the guards, right? So if you've ever played Pac-Man, you've probably noticed there's some discrete behaviors, right? Like if you if you're wandering the maze and the ghosts get near you, they start chasing you. If you eat a power pellet, now they're running away from you. So those are discrete events that happen based on certain inputs, certain <coughs> inputs to the system. Um, so what are specifications for finite state machines? So uh, sort of you can take a whole class on models of computation and go through a lot of, regular, uh, uh, a lot of uh, things about <coughs> finite state machines and proving properties and equivalences between them. Uh, but essentially, the way it's most typically defined as to what uh, an accepting uh, set of inputs is to a finite state machine is that you'll define accepting states. And those are states where if you take that sequence of transitions and, and you end there, then that, that set of inputs is an accepting input. Um, and so for specifications for finite state machines, you can use something like regular expressions. Um, and so this basically means that uh, if the inputs are letters and uh, you have a finite state machine, then a regular expression can define what that finite state machine is, is doing. Right? Um, for systems that have finite inputs, that's fine. So the first extension that people do to uh, finite state machines is they consider infinite inputs. Right? So this is an, a system that's interacting with the world continuously. Uh, and so then you have things like omega automaton. Um, things in the physical world, you usually model them as running forever. So that's why these are useful. Uh, rather than having a final accepting state, typically uh, there's different sorts of conditions on what uh, accepting, str accepting strings are for omega automaton, but one could be that a state is visited infinitely many often, infinitely many times. Um, and for specifications, it's no longer regular exp expressions, but you have temporal logics. 
So you might have things like linear temporal logic, uh, where you have certain operators like always, eventually, until next. Um, and sort of it's easier to explain the, rather than the semantics, you can explain examples of these. So this is a model of how traffic lights work in the US. Um, it's a little bit different in Sweden because there's this yellow red mode that is surprising to an American, right? So, uh, but specifications could be always eventually green. So the light eventually always will turn green. Um, and uh, maybe if the light's red, then the next state will be, uh, not be that the light turns yellow, right? So if you have a green turn arrow, then the next state will be that you'll have a, a green light, right? But temporal logic, notice that it captures ordering properties. Uh, it doesn't really capture timing properties. So despite the name temporal logic, uh, you have ordering properties. Um, so that was the discrete world. Uh, a hybrid automaton sort of extends that a little bit more because we want now systems, we want a model of systems that have these discrete behaviors. So it has everything that the other thing had, but we also want to have continuous behaviors. And the model of continuous behaviors we use is ordinary differential equations, right? So the way to think of it is finite state machine plus ordinary differential equations. Um, now, differential equations are hard. So within the research field of hybrid systems uh, and hybrid automaton, they'll typically split into different classes of hybrid automaton based on the complexity of the differential equations. Um, so the simplest class is timed automaton. So there's tools like Upal that uh, work very well with timed automaton. And so this is where you limit your differential equations to basically x dot equals 1. So you just have timers, and you can reset these timers uh, in certain ways. Um, and then the, the, the nice thing about timed automaton is there's some sort of equivalence with uh, finite state machines or omega automaton with them. So that's why that's a separate class by itself. There's a set of methods that work with timed automaton. Uh, you can think of you know, multi uh, rectangular automaton or piecewise constant automaton, where it's not just timers, but you have things that uh, increase sort of at a maximum and minimum velocity. Right? So you have constants, constant lower bounds and upper bounds. Uh, you can think of uh, linear uh, ordinary differential equations. So a dot e x dot equals ax, right? That's typical for a first year control class. Um, Piecewise affine, uh, multi affine, that's slightly nonlinear. Uh, and then maybe even full non methods that work for full nonlinear systems, right? So you can see that from the F16 example, you need the full nonlinear one. Or you need methods to convert between these, which those methods also exist. Uh, fit girl. So, uh, if you look at a paper that uses a hybrid automaton, there's a nice mathematical description of this too, but it's sort of hard to remember. So I prefer using this uh, anagram to remember what a hybrid automaton is. So FICRL is flows, inputs, transitions, guards, invariants, resets, and locations. Hmm. And if you want to draw this, you start at the bottom and you first draw the locations, right? So there's a finite set of locations in a hybrid automaton. Um, each of those locations has flows, so these are differential equations. So this could be you know, a temperature when you're in this mode is going by this differential equation. Otherwise, it's going by this differential equation. And so the categories of hybrid automaton is basically going to affect what types of ordinary differential equations you can have in each of the modes. Uh, inputs. So the way I like to add non-determinism to the system is using external inputs. So here I've modified the differential equation and added this sort of term that's within some interval. And so at every point in time, you could actually choose a value between minus 0.1 and 0.1 and you'll have different uh, solutions to the differential equations, different trajectories. And these can vary between the modes as well. Uh, transitions, so with finite state machines, you have transitions. You also need the rules on the transitions. Those are the guards. Um, and so these are uh, state-based switches. Um, if the temperature goes above 79, uh, in this case, then you can take this guard. And so notice I said, can take this guard. Doesn't mean you're, you, you're forced to take the guard. So they're not urgent transitions. Um, so you have this non-determinism in the, in, the, in the differential equations that's sort of continuous non-determinism. You can also have non-determinism on the switches. So you can have switches that are enabled but not forced. So the way, if you wanted to force a switch, the way you would do it is actually by adding invariance. Um, <coughs> so an invariant on a mode is a condition that's always satisfied when you're within this, uh, this location or mode. Um, so if these are the you know, opposites of each other, then you can guarantee that when that condition becomes true, the transition is sort of forced to occur at that point in time. And the last thing you can have is, is resets, where you make assignments to the um, continuous variables along a transition, when the transition is taken. Um, hybrid automaton execution. So uh, a hybrid automaton, if you run it with one input, uh, you can look at a possible behavior of the hybrid automaton. We call that an execution. right? So 
Similarly, if you have a finite state machine and you have a certain sequence of inputs, then you can look through a transition, transition of the modes. So it's useful for getting intuition <coughs> about the, the system. Uh, for example, if you have this hybrid automaton, so this one is modeling the temperature uh, in a room, and there's the heater is either on or it's off. Um, if the heater, if the temperature gets too low, the if the temperature gets too low when the heater's off, then the heater could switch on, and sort of vice versa. Um, and there's some gap between the invariant of the mode and the guard. Then an execution might look something like this, where if you're in the on mode, your temperature is increasing. As soon as you get between these two conditions where the guard becomes enabled and the invariant is not yet false, then you can transition to another, uh, to the off mode, and then temperature will decrease, and then you sort of oscillate like this. So that's one execution of a hybrid automaton. For, for verification purposes, um, we're less interested in uh, particular executions, but instead we want reachability. So we've heard it a little bit this week as well, but it's basically, uh, you can think of it the set of states that a particular hybrid automaton can enter. Um, under any execution. So if you resolve the non-determinism in any way, both in the continuous non-determinism and the discrete non-determinism, um, which states will you enter? And that's more useful for, ver for verification, right? Because uh, if I had an unsafe state where uh, I could prove that this reachable set of states didn't touch the unsafe states, then I could say my system is verified. Uh, specifications. So we had specifications for finite state machines and these uh, omega automaton, we have temporal logics. So for hybrid systems, there's also uh, methods to give specifications over now this sort of richer class of models. So there's uh, signal temporal logic specifications. And the way I think of those are, it's temporal logic, so you have all the same operators always, eventually. Uh, but it's extended with notions of time. So uh, you could imagine this is an example of a, a specification. Always, eventually, within 0 to 30 seconds, the light turns green. So this is now a richer model. It's not just about ordering. It's going to tell you that when you go to the, the light, eventually it'll be green within 30 seconds. Uh, and so given this, uh, this is a timed automaton now because I have uh, this variable t that ticks at rate 1 in each mode, so they're clocks. And I have uh, resets along the transitions. You could ask, is this spec satisfied, right? Um, and so that's a good question. Um, Flow pipe construction. So uh, this is sort of the main part that I wanted to get into. Um, and so this is the, the method to analyze uh, hybrid automaton in a formal way. I think I have a few minutes more. Maybe I can start this. OK. Uh, well, first, any questions on the first three parts? So, okay. All right. Uh, flow pipe construction. So there's many ways to formally verify a hybrid automaton. Um, as we saw in some of the previous talks this week, too, people have different ways to analyze it. So I don't want to say that this is the only way or the best way, uh, but it's the way I, I like to analyze them. Uh, essentially, what flow pipe construction is, is it's a, a set-based simulation method. Um, so if you think of how simulations work, you have an initial set of states, or initial state, actually. And you, you run the simulation of the system, and then you see what the system does. So <coughs> flow pipe construction tries to do that same type of reasoning, but now with sets of states. So you have a set of initial states. You look at how that set evolves over time. And you construct these tubes of the system through the state space. Um, and so it's useful for proving properties about transient system states. So this is in contrast with, um, if you look at traditional control theory, you might be interested in stability properties. Is the system stable? Uh, reachability, you would get behaviors of from the initial set of states after some finite time, you usually have a time bound. Um, is the system, does the system stay safe uh, for those, those states? Here's a visualization of that. Um, so if you had, this is a system now where you have a certain vector field, so the trajectories go like this. You have an initial set of states, which is uh, the set of states along this line. And that's a, you know, if you count how many simulations you would have to do to cover the line, of course, that's infinite, right? There's an infinite number of states you would have to try. Uh, but if you're doing flow pipe construction and you have some uh, fixed time step, you could say that initially you're in this set of states. After the first time step, you're guaranteed to be within this set of states. And you construct sort of these tubes, right? And so something I, you might notice here is this is sort of, you have fixed discrete time steps, right? So um, flow pipe construction methods don't necessarily just have this. Sometimes they have, um, you can think of continuous time um, uh, properties, right, where you want to reason over all possible times. Um, and so 
in research, you'll see both pe people do both things, right? Uh, this actually turns out to be our, uh, the hard part of the problem. Uh, reasoning between time steps is not as difficult. Uh, typically, for something like dense time, what people will do is you first do the reasoning in discrete time. So imagine this is your initial set of states. This is the set of states after 0.1 second. This is the initial set of states after 0.2 seconds. Um, after you've done that reasoning, um, you then have some method-specific reasoning about what can happen between these two time steps. So you know these ones exactly, but then you reason about what can happen between these two. Um, so something that you can imagine is it's not that you can get anywhere in a short amount of time. So for systems, if you have a Lipschitz constant, you can imagine if you're going at the maximum speed in any direction from this set of states for 0.1 seconds, that will bound the set of states you can handle. And now if that doesn't intersect your unsafe states, and for every sort of uh, every one of these between zones, uh, that doesn't intersect your unsafe set of states, and these don't intersect your unsafe set of states, then your system is safe for dense time as well. Right? Uh, and then further, if you make the, the time steps smaller, the, the, the sort of over approximation you get by doing this uh, you know, worst case analysis in every possible direction, that'll shrink. Right? So you can get tighter and tighter results. Um, so uh, continuous and discrete post. Um, so this is, again, the, the temperature system I had before. How would you actually do flow pipe construction for this system? Um, so starting at an initial mode, um, this is reachability. Um, uh, you would compute, basically, uh, there's two operations. That's what I'm saying. There's continuous post operation and a discrete post operation. So you start in this set of states where you're in the on mode at a particular temperature, and you first start with a continuous post operation in the on mode. And so what continuous post does is it reasons using the differential equations. What are the set of states that uh, you can go from this initial set of states under the differential equations, not worrying about the guards at all, uh, maybe only worrying about the invariant, right? Um, and so then so you would get this green set of states. Um, if you look at the, um, a after you've done this, you then uh, do a discrete post operation. And so discrete post will look at all the outgoing guards of within the hybrid automaton. And guards are essentially conditions which define sets of states. So the guard condition here is that um, the, after the temperature has increased, when the temperature uh, exceeds some high temperature, then you'll take this guard. And so that can be represented here by this blue set of states, where all the temperatures where you're higher than theta high is the guard extending up to infinity. Right? Um, so you'll do a geometric intersection <coughs> between these sets of states, and you get the set of states that's the um, the start states for the next mode in the hybrid automaton. So when you do the intersection between reach on and the guard, you get this red set of states. Now you can think of this as sort of an initial set of states, and you'll do reachability now in the off mode uh, with a different differential equation. Um, and so you can imagine this is sort of the standard algorithm. This would sort of repeat over and over again. Um, and then you'd, you'd sort of get this set of states, you get this intersection, and then in the standard algorithm, you would keep repeating, essentially. There's no termination checking. So the way the, the system terminates is you either have uh, a bound on the number of discrete post states that you consider, or you could have a bound on the amount of time that elapsed as well. So that's the way that the system stopped. But you can imagine, uh, if you have the capability to do uh, checking if one set of states is contained in another one, as soon as you compute the reachability in the off mode, you might realize that this intersection is contained in this reachability in the on mode. And therefore, you could say that you're, you're sort of done, right? You, that set of states isn't going to reach any new states. It's just going to cycle forever. And then you'll say you've finished computing the reachable set of states for uh, infinite time. Uh, discrete post. So um, this is an interesting property. Um, basically, when you're doing discrete posts, some things can happen. <laughs> so I mentioned the continuous post operation. It's sort of you have this discrete time <coughs> steps that you do, and then you do reasoning about sets between time steps. Um, so what can happen is if, you're, if you have a guard in your state space, and you're computing the reachable set of states, imagine this is the set of states at one particular time, and these are sort of the incremental time steps. Um, this intersection between the guard and the reachable set of states doesn't just occur at one point in time. It'll occur at several points in time. Um, so if you were to do a geometric intersection, what you'd really do is you'd do sort of one intersection at every point in time. So you started tracking one set of states, um, and then after doing this computation, now the initial states for the next mode is a union of 10 set of states, which you can treat one by one. 
And then for the next mode, each of those might spawn 10 more sets of states. And you have this sort of exponential explosion in the set of states uh, that you're tracking, right? Um, so you could do that if you're willing to wait a long time, um, or if your system has certain properties where this doesn't occur. Uh, but what typically happens is you do an aggregation step. So this is what it's called aggregation in discrete host. So uh, you, instead of representing these sets, sets of states individually, you'll construct, you want, you want to do something like a union operation of these. Um, but depending on your set representation, union might uh, not be efficient. For example, imagine my set of states is boxes, right? Uh, if I want to do a union uh, of this set of states with a box, I don't get the exact union. I get an over approximation of the union. Uh, which is fine for safety verification in the sense that if you do this union and then you compute reachability using the union and that's safe, then your system is still safe. Uh, but it's bad because it introduces over approximation error, right? So uh, if you have over approximation error, it's possible that you'll say this unsafe states are reachable, but actually they weren't reachable. They're just reachable because I have error in this geometric <coughs> operation. So that's a concern. Um, typically algorithms will not use boxes. Instead, you'll use something like polygons or other data structures that I'll get into later. And then instead of doing box over approximation, you'll do something like a convex hull. Right? That's, a, that's a typical operation people will do. Or they'll do template over approximation. Right? So if you had a polygon, um, if, you had a, if your representation wasn't boxes but rotated boxes, then you could imagine you could fit a nice rotated box that captures this intersection well. Um, and then the question is, how did you know which way to rotate it? So there's research, again, how to come up construct with these templates, how to construct these templates such that error is low. So the flow pipe construction algorithm that I just described um, makes use of various set operations on possibly high dimensional state sets. Right? So depending on how many variables in, your, in the system you have um, is going to determine how many dimensions you need to track at each point in time. And so a lot of operations on sets are efficient in two or three dimensions, but they become very inefficient as you start getting to 10 dimensions or 20 dimensions. Um, so these are the operations that you need. Um, time elapse operation, so that's for continuous post. Um, checking if intersections are empty, time elapse, taking intersections, union, and set containment. Um, if your, uh, your hybrid automaton uh, is such that you only care about a continuous system, you don't have discrete dynamics, and you only care about fixed time steps, then you only really need these two operations. Right? If you're ca caring about continuous time, uh, then you might need something like Minkowski sum, and I'll get into that later. It's sort of like a bloating. Uh, that's what it's used for in this case anyway. So you can take a set of states and bloat it. So then you can have continuous time, continuous systems. Um, if you have really discrete systems, then you need to worry about how, how good is your representation for taking intersections? How good is your intersection for uh, doing a union operation? Um, and then finally, uh, set containment. So this one's not used as often uh, in hybrid systems research and tools, but really if you want to talk about infinite time reachability, you need to check if your set of states is within, contained within a set of states you've already computed from. And then so you need set containment uh, checking within your representation. So as you can see, you want all those operations, but uh, the representation you use will affect how well you can actually do those operations. Uh, so in the research, there's, they've considered many different set operations, right? Um, so examples are things like boxes or hyperrectangles, uh, polytopes. So there's different uh, forms of polytopes. There's a constraint representation where you have uh, intersection of hyperplanes, and there's also a vertex representation where it's actually just the, the set of uh, corner points, essentially. Uh, and both have been considered. Uh, ellipsoids have been considered, um, which are sort of like high-dimensional ovals. Uh, support functions uh, and generalized star sets, I'll go into those a little bit later as to how those work. Uh, and also things like Taylor models for representing sets of states. Um, and so that's sort of good for nonlinear systems. Um, so for Just one question. So yes. these represent a set of states mm -hmm. or also the time dimension? Mm -hmm. so these represent sets of states, and the way I'll represent, if you're interested in properties about time, um, the way that I'll do that is similar to uh, sort of what Andre did, where you add an explicit time variable to your system, add, add a differential equation that it takes at rate one, and then these sets of states will contain the, the time dimension as well. Um, time is a special dimension, though, too. So there's certain um, there's tricks you can do with time as well if you don't need to model it explicitly. 
Um, so for this uh, sort of summer school, I'll focus on these four representations, uh, in particular the last three actually. So polytopes, especially vertex form polytopes, are sort of easy to explain, uh, but they don't work well in high dimensions. And so I'll show why why that is. But the, these three are really the focus: uh, zonotopes, support functions, and generalized star sets. Um, Excuse me. Yes. Uh, I don't understand the Taylor model because all all uh, correspond to some kind of sets. But the last one, Taylor model, mm -hmm. is, is a form of set, no? So the, the way the Taylor models, yeah, maybe I should be more precise. So in a tool, Flowstar, they use Taylor models to do reachability analysis. And they actually have a, it's a sort of a, a representation where you have a polytope with a remainder interval and, and bounds on all of your variables. So in a sense, it represents a set of states as long as you can meet the polynomial conditions and you stay within those bounds. So that's how th they use it to represent sets of states. OK. Right. Um, so I think um, probably I'll stop here for now. Um, and then next time, we'll get into uh, these three representations. So, uh, any last questions, I guess, before lunch? Thank you.